Hey everyone, um, welcome to uh, the user group. Um, my name is Matt Wicks. I'm talking about Azure DevOps and GitHub, the 10 missing bits. So um, the, the reason around this is, you know, frequently um, I hear developers talk and, you know, they say things like, oh, it's, it's too hard to do this on GitHub. Um, on Azure DevOps, it's, it's just a tick box. It's super easy. Um, so, so what I thought I'd do is I'd talk about, you know, some of the differences between the two platforms. Uh, just point out the differences and um, how they deal with things, because it is slightly different, and I think some perspective helps. So as I said before, my name's Matt Wicks. I'm an SSW solution architect. Um, I also got uh, the GitHub admin um, certified partner uh, from the beta exams, which is cool. Um, I like to say I was on a keyboard before I could crawl. Uh, my kids were as well, but you know, I, was, I did it before it was cool. Um, I've also consulted for Microsoft and GitHub as part of the Azure DevOps and GitHub fast track programs where you know, I go into uh, a company, I help uh, a team with a, with a given um, product, work with Azure DevOps or GitHub, get them with good DevOps practices so they can be you know, like a lighthouse, a beacon for the rest of the organization so um, they can you know, spread the DevOps lifestyle. Uh, which which uh, you know helps them overall. Um, you can find me on uh, GitHub and on my blog and on Twitter. Uh, all the links are there. Unfortunately, somebody took Wikipedia on Twitter, so I wasn't able to get that. Uh, bit sad about that. We've got a cool uh, SSW Rewards app. It's recently been redone, looking super cool. I hear Maui's on the backlog somewhere, but you know um, it will be upgraded as pretty soon. Um, there's a QR code there. You can scan it with your phone. Hopefully you're not watching this on this phone. Otherwise, it's going to be a little hard to scan that. Um, but we give away points and prizes. Um, so install that. At the end of the talk, I'll have another QR code. You can scan with that app and get some points. So I think I need to call out the elephant in the room with this talk. Uh, we're talking about Azure DevOps. We're talking about GitHub. Um, you actually need to move over to GitHub if you're on Azure DevOps at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, I have to give the consultant answer. Uh, it depends. Uh, really, it, it, it does depend on your current situation and um, what you need out of, the, out of your tools and what you're working with at the moment. Um, hopefully, I can set some expectations around things so you can make a better informed choice later down the track. So let's get into it. Azure DevOps. Um, this is the homepage for it. I mean, I, I know it as VSTS originally, so uh, no, TFS actually. So it was originally Team Foundation Server in 2005. So what's that, 20? No, not 20 years ago. My math's gone. <laughs> 17 years ago, a uh, long time. Um, it was Team Foundation Server, then it was Visual Studio Team Services. Um, if that's not a mouthful, I don't know what is. Uh, now it's Azure DevOps, and um, you can see from the tagline up here, plan smarter, collaborate better, and ship faster with a set of modern dev services. So keywords, plan, collaborate, ship. That's what I, what I take out of it. Um, it's, it's real enterprise software, it's awesome. Uh, it has its roots deep in you know, the beginnings of you know, ALM, uh, and, and it really shows. Um, nowadays, if you were to start up a new project, so let's say, hey, I wanna try out Azure DevOps and, and play around with things, um, I did that recently for a client to, to get them up and running, and I hit this issue, which was a bit concerning, um, where I spun up a new organization, went to set up some pipelines for them to show how cool and it was, and bang, I hit a, a, a known issue. Um, I classified as an issue where I wasn't giving any, given any free minutes to run my DevOps uh, build pipelines, which kind of sucked. Uh, I had to fill out a Microsoft form, and a few days later they came back and said, oh yeah, we've enabled the, the free minutes on there. I'm not a big fan of that experience personally. I'd like, if I'm trialing out some stuff, I just want to get in and use it. I don't want to, I could have gone for the self-hosted route, but you know, they'll host what's called ephemeral runners, uh, eph eph ephemeral agents, it's DevOps. Um, so I don't have to set anything up and you know, they manage all that. Uh, I didn't have access to it, it didn't look good for the client, um, but we could fire up something in GitHub and it just worked. Um, so I kind of see it as they're making it a little harder to start uh, a new DevOps org. Read into it what you want. Um, I'm not going to say one or the other because they are still supporting their on-premise product, which is a big deal. 
So this is Azure DevOps server, not service. Uh, On-premise, you run on your own hardware or in a cloud uh, on your own VM. And um, that's got support until 2030, which is awesome, because that's eight years away. My math still works. Um, almost to, well, eight, eight, eight years in a month. So that's cool. Uh, but one of the concerning things here is this 2020 bit. We're in 2022. And um, 2020 was a while ago. So what they used to do was every quarter, they'd get all the new features from Azure DevOps, put it into an update and push it out. And then every year there'd be a new major version. They've stopped doing that. And now there's just little updates to the point where I think the last one was like, hey, they had a one or two bug fixes. Um, so it's kind of trickling out. And you can see that from the roadmap. So when you look here, um, I've zoomed down a bit. It, you, the, what it says isn't really that important, but here we've got uh, quarter three features coming out, quarter four, and some features in the future. Now, um, it's not a lot of features. I think it's like 29. There's some stuff in preview. I'm not sure if that's part of the 29, I forget. I counted it before, um, but it's not a lot. You can look at this two ways, glass half empty, half full. You can say it's not a lot of features, which I've said a few times, or you can say, well, it's a finished product. It doesn't need to have a big roadmap. Um, either way, it, it, it is what it is. So that's the, the roadmap. Um, I've said some negatives, which I feel bad. So I want to say some positives about it because it is, it is a great product. Um, one of the things is data residency. So if that's a concern for you, when you're starting up a Azure DevOps org in the cloud, you can actually choose what region you, you want your, your code to be stored in. Because if that's a, it, it's an important concern. Uh, especially around data sovereignty laws. Um, so you get that option. You don't get that option with GitHub. Uh, if you want to do that, you need to use GitHub Enterprise and host on your, your own servers or on a, a cloud VM or something like that. Or you have to go for GitHub AE, which is their super hardcore security version. I think there's only like one deployment in AUNZ, like in our region at the moment. Um, but uh, it's, it's not as easy as Azure DevOps. Since we talked about GitHub, let's get into, have a quick look at GitHub. So um, again, their homepage, let's build from here together, the complete developer platform to build, scale, and deliver uh, secure software. So um, you kind of think GitHub is the new, new kid on the block. Um, Azure Dev, well, TFS was out in 2005. GitHub was founded in 2008. So they're actually about as old as each other. Not a big difference. Um, but looking at the at the uh, the tagline, it, it really for me it comes together that hey this is a premium engineering platform. Um, now I've said engineering, I haven't focused on plan and and, and things like that, um, but this still is a full end to end tool set. Um, you know the planning side isn't as rich as Azure DevOps. We'll get into that in a sec, uh, but it, it's an active space. Like just as we saw in the news. There's a whole bunch of uh, new features being released for GitHub issues. Um, the thing with GitHub is that they'll give a lot of stuff away for free on their public repositories. It's really leaning into their, their open source heritage. Um, but if you want to tick all the boxes, you have to go for at least enterprise and sometimes pay a little bit more depending on what you want to access. Going to the roadmap, um, I'm zoomed in a bit, but we can see just at the top here, um, that, what's that, 52. So 52 features in this quarter, that's huge. Azure DevOps had 29 for the foreseeable future. Um, if we go and look to a similar style, you know, we'll just look to foreseeable future on GitHub, you know, we're talking 122 features, big numbers um, in comparison. So yes, much bigger roadmap. Um, this, it's quite an active roadmap as well. And there's most probably stuff on there that they're not ready to publicize. So it could be you know, bigger under the surface. Hopefully this is all, you know, like let's, let's make the assumption that you know, this was enough to convince you, yes, let's go GitHub. Um, I've got this thing on Azure DevOps. Uh, did you know that you can take what you've got on Azure DevOps and move it over to GitHub? Uh, you most probably did. Uh, and you most probably thought, hey, I can import a repository or I can just go to the git command line and say, oh, I want to change the remote and push to GitHub. You know, that, that works. It pushes the code. It's fine. But there's another way to do it if you're you know, going for that enterprise solution. You can migrate almost all of the things 
um, using the GitHub Enterprise Importer. Uh, it was formerly called OctaShift, in case you've heard that term. I think that's a cool name, but uh, it's not enterprise enough, so they renamed it. Uh, this is installed as an extension to the GitHub CLI, so the GH command. Um, if you're not using the GitHub CLI, highly recommend it. Uh, and it will look at your Azure DevOps uh, setup. It'll look at all the projects, grab all the repos, all the pull requests, which aren't actually part of your Git repository, um, all the comments on those, maybe even some branch policies, and move that over to GitHub, and then sort of make the old DevOps project, de decommission that, light up the new one, which is really cool. It doesn't migrate everything, though. Um, so if you had any pipelines in there, work items, artifacts, test plans, releases, dashboards, and any other permissions, they're not going to flow through, unfortunately. Um, I think the big one to call out there is the pipelines. There are tools uh, that you can use to translate Azure DevOps pipelines in YAML um, and uh, to the GitHub actions in YAML, uh, but they're not really one-for-one -one translations most of the time because they're sourcing from different marketplaces. marketplaces. Uh, but when I'm you know, making that transition, sometimes I put the Azure Pipelines app in GitHub uh, in place, which means I can use GitHub as my code repo, and I can use Azure Pipelines still. And then eventually, um, what we'll do is migrate over to GitHub Actions by reassessing and reevaluating how we're doing things. Because the way they work is, is you know, not fundamentally different, but it's pivoted on on a point which we'll talk about, and um, that, that can change how you're working. Also, if you're on enterprise, um, you've got access to uh, all the inner source functionality, so you can, it's much easier to share things. Uh, there's a link there for the GitHub uh, CLI. So it's in the GitHub org, gh-gei. So from a first impressions point of view, um, look, I think Azure DevOps is, is slowing down in pace. Um, for the roadmap, for me, I like I'm, I like the bright shiny things, so I think I'd go with GitHub on this. Um, that's that's my initial impression and, and how that works. So when I'm talking about everything else, we're not done here. Nah, not not done yet. Um, look, this is the I, I want to I want to talk about it about uh, around a, a common theme. So this is the you know the DevOps lifecycle. Um, or the DevOps you know, lifestyle, if you're into that type of thing. And uh, we'll frame some of the, the features around you know, the different parts of the, of the life cycle. So we'll start with planning. Because plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Um, Eisenhower said it first. That's why it sounds better than how I say things. Um, but it's important because planning is where I notice the most pain. So it doesn't matter if it's like uh, an Uber Eats order or a software project. The most common question is, hey, when is it done? When am I going to have it in my hands? Um, no one likes a soggy burger. Uh, and no one likes half-baked software. So being ordered to um, have control of the backlog and be able to predict um, what's going to ship is very important. You know, As a consultant, I've got lots of clients. Um, some of them want to get the best bang for buck because they only have enough funds for MVP. So they want to make sure that all the important features get in so they're in production. That'll generate more revenue so they can reinvest in the product. It's incredibly important. And um, it, it, it can be a deciding point to you know, whether or not a project is, is successful or not. Sorry to the no estimates people, but that's my experience. This is the Azure DevOps backlog. We can see a lot of information on here. Uh, the first one I'd call out is the, the planning on the right. We can see that, hey, we've got Sprint 90. Um, that was a while ago. This is an old board, um, and you know we had 50 points in that in that sprint. 16 uh, work uh, PPIs uh, or stories. Um, in this case, the PPIs because it's using the Scrum template. Uh, a few bugs, and that's being worked on. Uh, we can see we can turn on the forecasting feature. So here it will take anything that's not committed already. So we're not working on it already, and um, you know we'll. Say, hey, look, we got a velocity of about 20 points. Bad example, given we've got 50 points in the current sprint. But it'll say, look, here's eight, eight, two, two. So there's 20 points. These are committed, don't have estimates. So we can, based off all the, the efforts I'm there, we think that you'll ship this stuff before the next sprint release too. 
which has way too many points in it. <laughs> so um, this, is, this is really important. So like, we know we've got funds for three sprints. Let's plug in the velocity, see where that line goes. Do we need to reprioritize? We can just drag and drop and do this. Um, really important. The other cool thing that Azure DevOps has is a few different roadmap functionalities. So there's like three different extensions you could use. They all kind of look the same, where we can have milestones plotted against a calendar. We can see what sprints drop into and the features that will drop in those things. This gives us the ability to telegraph when functionality will be released. And we can synchronize with different parts of the business to make sure that they know when things will drop. So like if a marketing campaign needs to happen, because we're gonna go into private preview. We know kind of when that date is and what feature is gonna be in there. Flipping over to GitHub, uh, we talked in the news a little bit about um, improvements to GitHub issues. Um, this is the new projects board, which uh, the projects list, issue list, which is um, part of the new GitHub projects, which is GA. Um, we can see lots of information here. Uh, you can have different save views in these tabs. You can see here I've got, uh, it says minus status done. So I've hidden anything with the status of done. Um, we've got all our different you know, issues there. We can see what issue number there, the things are, um, the status is, who it's been assigned to, what sprint it's in, and it'll actually, um, you know, we can say, hey, it's a fortnightly thing and it'll start predicting dates. Uh, we can assign estimates to it and labels, which we had before. That's really cool. The other cool thing is I can take this board, I can go on here and click, and here we got our layout. Now, we're looking at it in a table view, I can flip it over to a board view and we're seeing the same data, just in a slightly different way. So it's slicing it based off status. Um, again, one of the new features that dropped was, hey, you can hide particular statuses. So usually there'd be a done column here. I'm hiding it because it's, uh, it's the, well, in this case, it's the backlog. A board may not be the best way to view it, but we can see all the same information, just visualized differently. The other thing I can do is go up to this button here, and that brings up uh, our insights. So these are graphs that are generated based off the issues. So in this case, it's, it's pulled across the same filter. I can see the breakdown of what's to do, uh, what's in progress, we're hiding done. I'm sure done is gonna be huge on this board anyway. Um, and we can see all this, this information. Um, the other thing we can do is a thing called historical insights, which is specifically around um, you know, a GitHub paid plan, so Teams and Enterprise. I can go in there and then break down historically for each iteration um, how many you know, uh, issues we had and their type breakdown. So here I can see, hey, there was a bunch of UI work done initially. It sort of dropped off and it came back up. And at the same time, um, it took a few iterations before bugs started getting reporting, and then the, the last one was mostly bugs. So we can see a lot of valuable information here. You can even flip it over to like a cumulative view. So um, for a period of time, we want to see, you know, for the current sprint, what was the, the status breakdown. Um, now this type of stuff, I'm not saying it's unique to GitHub. You can do a lot of this stuff in Azure DevOps. The bit to call out though, is that the GitHub stuff is like almost fully customizable. So I can tweak off everything. It's just uh, drop down um, options to uh, change things and you can change it to what you need it to be, which is pretty cool. Unfortunately though, um, you don't get anything out of the box really. Whereas Azure DevOps, you get a nice burn down, a velocity chart and stuff out of the box. If that works for you, great. If you wanna have custom stuff, you've got the ability with GitHub. In terms of uh, roadmap planning, there's a feature called milestones. It's been around for a while. You're able to define a, a milestone, give it um, a due date. It'll track the percent complete based off the number of issues uh, that are assigned to it. So here, you know, it's got a tidy up documentation and um, a description about around what's happening, and you can see what's open and what's closed. That's pretty cool. I'd love it to show, you know, uh, percentage complete based off, you know, like an effort estimate, because usually that's a better indicator. I'm not able to do that here. Um, uh, but with milestones, they're very flexible. So it's not just, hey, I want to have the stuff for a particular version or um, a, uh, in this case, tidy up documentation. I can use it however I want. It's quite flexible, which is cool. So summarizing with planning, uh, Azure DevOps GitHub. Azure DevOps definitely has my thumbs up. 
There's, there's no, no doubt about it. It's a great planning tool. Um, I'm gonna give GitHub a conditional thumbs up because they are racing away with the features and are improving it you know, like monthly, uh, if not more frequently. So I think pretty soon it's gonna catch up and, and go ahead. Moving on to code. This is really important. We write a lot of code. Um, when I start out on a project, uh, one of the pain points I have is what we call the F5 experience. So I need to pull down a repo, read through a document. What do I have to install, set up, configure, speak to someone, no, the doc's out of date, I need to update it, it's a pain. Um, GitHub's got a cool thing called Code Spaces. Now, they'll host a dev environment for me and the configuration is all in code. So I can configure the Docker image, I can write the scripts to pre-configure an environment so that when I start on a new project, I just click, it spins it up on uh, in the cloud for me and my VS code just connects to it and away I go. So I've turned what could be like a day of setup to a couple of minutes. I think um, the GitHub team have this huge, you know, like uh, in terms of, you know, GitHub itself, um, they've, you know, brought it right down to minutes in terms of setup time, which is, which is insane considering how big GitHub is. Um, I'm not going to call out Codepilot here, Copilot, uh, because it's not specific to GitHub. You can use it if you're on Azure DevOps. That's just a, like an IDE extension. So Azure DevOps and pull requests. Um, this is a really nice UI. It's got some cool things going on here. Um, I can see that, that for this pull request, uh, it was completed, which is cool. I can see that um, there was code, there was required checks that were passed. If I click on required checks, then there's uh, a passing build. So it's gone through some sort of CI. Um, there were work items linked to it and somebody commented and, and they were all resolved. So, you know, that's cool. There was, you know, um, some, somebody reviewed the PR, actually found something and it was improved. I quite like that. Now, setting this all up on GitHub is a little different than on Azure DevOps. Uh, one of the tools I like to use to make it consistent is a thing called Settings. Now, that, this is a ProBot app, so you need to install a thing called ProBot and then install Settings. Um, I've got the link there in terms of the actual app itself, and it talks through how to, how to install. But essentially, you're taking um, the settings of the GitHub repo and turning it into code. So it's uh, repo settings as code, much like infrastructure as code. So on this one, we can see, hey, it was set there was a thing called private true. So this would have been whether or not the repo is private, they changed it to false, which made the repository public. What's good about this is this is a file in the repository. So I can see .github slash settings.yaml and there was a commit associated to it. So next time it's, you go look at the repo and you're like, hey, this looks different to when I last looked at it, what changed? You can actually look at the commit history to find out what actually changed and who changed it. You can do more than just the repo settings. So it's a little small, but here's all the settings for branches. Um, so here I can configure uh, the required builds that need to, uh, required workflows that need to pass in order for PRs to complete. So down here, required status check, checks, contexts, I can list out whatever workflows I need. That's really cool if I'm, you know, uh, well on GitHub, I have to have all my workflows as YAML. So, you know, I'm changing the build. Um, I'm adding a new workflow into there. I'll change the settings.yaml file as well. So in the same PR, I'll say, hey, look, this um, workflow needs to run successfully. Here's the workflow file for it. So I'm not in that chicken and egg situation that you can get into with Azure DevOps, where it's like, hey, I wanna make sure that this build, uh, this pipeline passes, but I haven't merged the pipeline yet. So, you know, someone else could get blocked. Now, we're talking about a file that can update repo settings, which are normally admin only. So there is an escalation issue going on here, um, but there's a way to preserve, you know, some control on it uh, so that you can open up this policy as code so that your engineers can do the right thing. They can make changes that, you know, that um, without getting admins involved by themselves, but you can still have checks and balances. So you can use a thing called the code owners feature and add, specify that settings.yaml is owned by particular people, a particular person or groups. So here I've got a file in GitHub. It's, it says it's owned by Octocat. And um, when I look at 
the code owners file, I can see, hey, there's a code owners file and settings.yaml is under it and there's a particular admin account that needs to approve that PR. So when I make a change to it and open up a PR, I can see that, hey, there's a code owner that needs to review this and I'm blocked from actually merging until they approve. So that way, you know, I can make, I can, my team can, you know, request, request changes and we just need to double check that it's okay. In terms of linking work items, which is one of the things that Azure does, Azure DevOps does really well, there's uh, a few different ways to do it. Um, essentially, the best way to do it is <clears throat> you add a new workflow that, you know, lints the pull request. So here we've got one that uh, checks for linked issues on the pull request. It's, you have a, a YAML file that says, hey, on a pull request, when it's opened, edited, reopened, or synchronized, just rerun um, and run this action, which will check for certain things. You know, in this case, um, is there uh, an issue linked to it? Um, that is at, well, if you Google GitHub action checked linked issues, um, that's actually the name of the action. So that's where you find it. Now, back to the PR on Azure DevOps. Um, we had a comment on there that was resolved. So I can see here, um, this is saying view original diff, so it looks like it's already been actioned. Um, if header triple equals subject, and then it says use triple equals. So most probably, like this is a, a TypeScript file. Somebody used double equals. They didn't know to use triple equals. There was a comment made to change it, and then it was resolved, and, and that change was made. That's really cool. Um, I kind of think that for simple cases, I'd rather just say, hey, what about doing it this way instead? And you can do that with GitHub really easily. So here I've, um, I can suggest changes in a better way. Here's a rule on SSW rules that I made a, a comment on. Um, we actually had to talk about this today because I made a controversial suggestion. Um, so I can see here anything being sent for public consumption, comma, nah. it's a nice line. I think it could be improved. So I click on the plus. It comes up where a place where I can make my comments. There's a button here saying add a suggestion. So when you click on that, it adds a bit of markdown into the comment, which is uh, by default, it's the verbatim thing, but I've changed it because I like the Oxford comma. Fight me on this. I've added a single comment. And then here it's actually said, hey, look, Wikipedia has made a suggested change um, from the red to the green. So it's this great change X to Y format. And um, the person who originally made the pull request is getting not only feedback, but a suggestion on how to you know, improve things um, because Oxford commas are better. And uh, this is actually really valuable for, for code as well. So if you've, you're a new developer to a language and you don't know the difference between double equals and triple equals, you can make that suggestion. And afterwards you can talk a little stuff about, hey, look, this is the difference between the two. Now you know. And they don't have to then go context switch, pull down the code, make the change, commit, push. They can just go in and click the commit suggest button and it adds a commit to um, the pull request, co-authored by the whoever opened the pull request and um, who made the suggestion. I think that's pretty cool. Um, does anyone else think this feature is cool? Yeah, lots of people. Um, is anyone surprised to learn about it or, yeah? You're all surprised? Well, you shouldn't be. It's been around since 2018, this feature. Not a lot of people know about it, it's funny. I can't talk about code without talking about security because we should be uh, shifting security as left as much as possible. Azure DevOps, you can do a lot of um, security things. I'm not gonna talk about security as a whole. Let's just talk about like package management and uh, dependency management. There's a, you can use third-party add-ins for Azure DevOps like White Source Bolt and um, you know, keep a track in terms of if there are any security advisories uh, for your packages. Um, now in GitHub, it's a little different and let's look at, have a look at it. You can have a, uh, an action that runs as part of your uh, PR flow um, that checks, you know, hey, let's review our dependencies. Um, so here it's, it's looked into different things and it said, hey, look, you gotta, you're running Ruby, there's a gem file and um, there's a high, high severity bug on this and then you got a package.json and there's, there's a vulnerability there and it can actually look for you. That's pretty cool. It seems more 
reactive to things. So maybe you're doing it on push or something like that. That's nice. Um, but sometimes if you've put some code up there, you don't know, um, you know what what stuff is if, if you don't you don't find out until there's more pushes done. Oh, we can find out some more you know information as well about this. So um, what's better is a thing called Dependabot. Now with this one, it'll actually keep a track of what's in your repository, and as security advisories are generated, like hey that version this version's got a bug, it'll actually add it to a security backlog. So you can see all the different vulnerabilities that are there. What's even cooler is um, the amount of information that it'll provide. So uh, you can drill into it. We can see, um, hey, we can't update to this to a non-vulnerable version. So it's like, hey, we've got a vulnerability, but um, there's no fix for it yet. We, we've got some, some context around it, and we can get some more information about these things. And what's even better is Dependabot can be configured to raise a pull request with a fix for it. So if um, I've got a, uh, you know, a JavaScript app up there, there's an NPM vulnerability, that happens, but I've got really good testing practices in place, um, I can actually have Dependabot, as it discovers the issue, it raises a PR with a fix, a build happens on that PR, it runs through all my integration tests, checks everything, all cool, yep, ship it to production. Now, we've removed that human interaction um, because we've got really good testing practices, but we've reduced that um, mean time to you know, security remediation as much as possible um, because it's all automated, which is awesome. Like that feature? Say like in the comments. Um, the other thing with security that happens is, hey, I pushed a secret to our code base. We need to cycle our, our API tokens or something like that. It happens, it shouldn't happen, but it does. Um, GitHub Enterprise has got a cool feature where it can actually block uh, pushes to GitHub if it detects secrets. So in this case, um, this looks like the, the GitHub um, desktop client and somebody's pushing some code. Um, the comment should give it away, exposing myself, but if you didn't notice it, it looks like there's a token in there to check out code. So if that's on a public repo or even it's on you know, private, you know, the information's out there. Uh, it's only a matter of time. So you assume breach. Uh, but anyway, they've gone and um, they've clicked to push um, and it's come up with an error. Now we can see here that it's like, hey, you know, um, you got an access token in there on this commit and uh, it's in on, on this file. Uh, you can click on, on this uh, link or you can copy and paste the link and we can review that to see what the story is. So they go in, highlight, go to the URL. Oh no, it's a false positive. It's all good. I meant to do that. And then it's saying, hey, the secret's allowed. We'll, we'll let that through. So they push again and it pushes through. Um, that's great. But there's actually a check and there's a balance in there to say, hey, look, we raised a security issue and it was closed by someone. So in case it was, wasn't a false positive, we can trace back and see what actually happened and what was actually stored. Um, that's pretty cool. You can configure uh, different secret um, you know, patterns as well. And um, if you accidentally commit something like, uh, I don't know, uh, an S3 bucket key or um, maybe a service bus um, you know, uh, signature the, to access that, um, what GitHub can do is detect it know where that came from, call the, the service. So if it's a you know, service bus uh, connection string, it goes, hey, look, that's bad. I'm going to go to Azure and actually say, hey, revoke this um, thing. Assume breach, revoke, done. Um, and you're tidying up some, some of the, the leaked information. I think that's pretty cool. It's better when you stop it before. But you know, if you don't have enterprise, at least they'll uh, for public repos, you can um, fall back on that and it'll clean up. Uh, the other cool thing is a thing called Go Code QL. It essentially turns your code base into like a big database, and then you can write queries over it and look for certain code flows or um, you know things in your code. Uh, now this does require like I say GitHub Enterprise plus plus. It's you have to be on GitHub Enterprise and then pay a little bit more for these features. Um, but if you want to, you can actually run it for free in VS Code. Um, there's an extension that you install. You just look for CodeQL. Um, and on this example, 
uh, we've got um, a code base that's put up and it's got a method here that deserializes a stream. And um, we've got a QL file that it kind of looks from where select, it's kind of like SQL, but not really. You got object notation and things like that. And um, it's spitting out that it's looked for this code flow and it says, hey, look, you haven't safely deserialized this. And uh, you can find these things in your code. Um, there's a whole open source repo with a bunch of uh, qu uh, queries that you can run against your code base and um, for different languages. So I think this is awesome. So let's just um, sum up coding. Um, Azure DevOps, I'm putting it in the slow camp. Um, it's got some, you know, it works, it works really well. But for me, GitHub is flaming hot emoji. Um, I, I love it and I think it's super hot. Like all the new features that they're, you know, piling into that. Um, it's, it's rapidly developing and I love that. Moving on from code to build. Now, um, you can't help uh, with build to talk about um, Azure pipelines and GitHub Actions. So let's have a, a quick look at that. So at a high level, um, I talked said that there was like a, not a fundamental difference, but it does pivot and it's around parallelism. So Azure DevOps, they actually charge for how wide you, like uh, how much you want to horizontally scale. So if you want to have uh, run things, multiple things in parallel, even if you bring your own server, they'll charge you for it, which you know kind of sucks. GitHub Actions though, they just charge you for CPU time. So if you're on a high enough plan, you can get 180 actions to workflows to run at once. Um, you're just paying for CPU time. I think that's pretty cool. And it changes the way that you write things. So you go for the small light, sort of like the microservice um, pipelines <laughs> uh, where you're checking for one little thing and you're getting that fast feedback, especially on a PR where it's like, hey, I don't want a, a lint failure to fail my build because those are ch kind of checking, checking two different things. On uh, Azure DevOps, you'll most probably have one long pipeline as opposed to a whole bunch of little ones. The other thing is what, is, what are you actually running on? Um, they both can run self-hosted agents and that's BYO, so that's an even playing field. But in terms of um, you know, hosted agents where you don't have to manage that infrastructure, for Azure DevOps, you're on sort of fixed cloud um, hosted agents. There are um, ephemeral, so there's, it's a new one every time, and that's for both platforms. But uh, on GitHub, uh, you're able to go, instead of going for like, hey, two cores and seven gigs of RAM just doesn't cut it anymore, uh, you can pay for a 64 core, 256 gig RAM uh, runner to run your, your builds. You may be doing more on those things, uh, but you've got this you know, beefy set of hardware that you don't have to, you're renting essentially. Um, I think that's really cool. Um, in terms of the, you know, the not cool stuff, um, GitHub isn't tracking your test analytics when you're running builds, uh, but Azure DevOps does. And you know, hey, sometimes I like to see that we added more tests this build. I can see that on, on, on the pipeline run. Or, hey, tests took longer to run. What's actually going on? Um, you don't get that front and center. Hopefully they're adding that soon, um, but I'm gonna show you a couple of ways around that. One of the gotchas between the two that I find is that uh, on both YAML files, there's a property called name. On Azure DevOps, that's the build name. So you can put like the date in there, uh, revision numbers, a whole bunch of cool dynamic things. On GitHub Actions, you're actually defining a workflow name, which is the equivalent to the pipeline name, not the build name. So you're not able to, to change that. And that kind of you know, gets some people in terms of, oh, I could have this dynamic ID. Um, you can't do that anymore. But there are um, environment variables that you can reference with unique build identifiers. When I was talking about tracking test analytics, this is the screen on Azure DevOps. Um, so we can see here on this uh, project, there are 103 tests run. Um, it took 36 seconds. That went up, it was, it was 15 seconds slower than the time before. So that's actually an important metric to see. Hey, why is it slower? Did we change something that, you know, is the code actually running slower? We can find out in our tests. Um, and I get a nice trophy emoji because 100% test pass, love that. On um, GitHub, you don't get that, but what you can do is add in some act, add some actions to your workflow to report on this stuff. So at least you know you get a little bit more visibility. You don't need to look at the console logs. So here's the test reporter action that's in the marketplace, and it adds this test results job 
with uh, a nice looking summary. So I can see, oh, the test results, there's a cross, something failed. Um, we go down, 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 right at the bottom of the screen. It looked like one test failed and I can see how long it took. So look, not as good, um, but that's, I can, I can still report on it in, to an extent. The other thing you can do with GitHub Actions is um, you know, spit out Markdown and have it as part of the summary of, of the job. So here, there's a step in here that runs a, um, a command. It just echoes some stuff into a variable. And then that gets rendered out in a nice Markdown at the bottom. Um, you can see here the rocket emoji is using like sort of um, Slack style uh, emoji as opposed to uh, Unicode emoji, but um, you still get nice output. So you could write your own things to parse uh, like, you know, maybe you want to grep over stuff and then spit out some markdown. You can do that here. So, builds. My, my verdict. Azure DevOps, unfortunately, slowing down. It is feature complete. It's expected. GitHub. I, I think it's hot. Um, I really love being able to write the little workflows and parallelize things and just have that fast feedback loop, especially around, um, you know, little things that... Uh, if I can get that fast feedback, then hey, I can continue on and fix it and move on. I don't have to push one change, wait for it to, to fall over somewhere else, push one change. If I can get, hey, there's four <coughs> thing, different things wrong with it, let's just tackle it and get it done. Of course, after we build, we test. Now, we've covered automated testing already as part of builds. I don't really want to cover that again because it's, you know, it's covering up again. Um, what I want to do is look at manual testing and test analytics. Now, Azure DevOps has a cool um, you know, test plans runner, and it's got awesome analytics. Um, this is all around manual tests. Um, there's no equivalent in GitHub, unfortunately. Uh, I don't use this personally, but we do have a test practice lead, and I'm sure he's got some really important opinions on this. But for me, um, it, it, it's not making a big difference in my world. I like to automate a lot of my tests, especially integration tests. So Azure DevOps, yes, it's got it. Uh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing for GitHub not to have it though. Let's move on to release. Now, we've got deployment later on. So with releases, what I'm looking at is, hey, um, we've got like a microservices application or something. I need to publish packages for my other applications to consume. So they both have um, different package managers that you can, you can reference in, in private. You don't need to spin up your own. Um, there's Azure Artifacts and GitHub Packages. They all kind of do the same thing. Uh, you can see that Maven, NPM, and NuGet are common between them. For my, you know, 99% of the time, it's NPM or NuGet for me. So they both tick my box. Um, I guess the difference is one's got Python package, you know, Python uh, feeds. If you do Python, that's important because GitHub doesn't have it. Uh, GitHub has another Java-based one, Gradle. So if you don't use Maven, you use Gradle. It's available. If you do Ruby, there's Ruby gems. If you want to have Docker containers pushed there, you can use the GitHub's Docker manager. Um, it's not a big deal breaker for me because you know if you're not if there's not GitHub, you're most probably using Docker Hub. Um, or you're using uh, a like Azure Container Registry or something like that. So in terms of my verdict, it does the job, but GitHub does the job as well. So it's, it's a level playing field. Let's have a quick look at deployment. Now, this is another uh, big one for me. Now, with deployments, um, you've got to get the code out there onto the environments. You want to make sure there's enough checks and balances in place that you're not pushing to things prematurely, or um, maybe you've got a cab approval process and you need to get things approved. Now, Azure DevOps has a concept of environments. So in your pipelines, you can say, hey, I'm deploying to a specific environment, and then I can add checks in there beforehand. The main ones that you tend to use are uh, approvals. So certain people need to sign off on this. Um, maybe you want to restrict from a certain branch if, um, if that's important. Um, the other one I like here is business hours. So I've work, worked for companies in the past where it's like, hey, we've got a line of business application. We've got people on the phones using that application all the time. We can't afford downtime during business hours. So I can put a check in here to say, hey, look, don't deploy within this time. Here's our deployment window. So once somebody approves, it'll sit there and wait until that uh, deployment window and then do all the automated things to update and if required, roll back. 
We can also do other things to, hey, we want to invoke an Azure function. We want to make sure we're the only ones deploying to this environment. Or um, we want to check Azure Monitor to make sure like, hey, we're, in, we're outside of business hours, but is, is the usage low? Are we going to affect a lot of people? We can run all, those, run all this custom stuff there. On GitHub, it's a little spartan. So we do have the ability to have required approvers or required reviewers. Um, so people or teams that need to you know, say yes. Um, we can specify a wait timer in case we want to make sure that, hey, look, you just deployed to UIT. Let's let it sit for 24 hours before going to prod. We can put those checks in place. We can do um, deployment branches, so branch filtering. But that's about it. Um, there's environment secrets, and there's a parallel to that in, in Azure DevOps. Uh, but I can't configure business hours. And once all the uh, protection rules are satisfied, it's gonna, just going to fire and go. Uh, so I, I feel a little less than on this. Um, it's almost as if, hey, you want me to use Octopus to, to make this happen, which is a great tool. Um, but if I don't want to use a third-party tool, Azure DevOps just seems a little bit better. When we're talking about variable and secret management, like not everything is in you know, the zero trust environment where we're passwordless and sometimes we do need to store API keys and things like that. Hopefully we're doing it in Key Vault and our apps are referencing it. Um, but if we're not, uh, we may have to store some stuff in Azure DevOps or GitHub in secrets in there. So look, with uh, Azure DevOps, we do have the concept of a variable library. It looks you know, painstaking, like unfortunately very familiar to Octopus, like they copied it. Um, but we do have a variable library, and it can be shared across pipelines. In GitHub, we manage our environment variables in the workflow file, which is fine. They're not secrets. They can be in there. And then uh, th I think that's a bit better because we'll have a commit history behind it. Uh, when we want to store secrets, uh, Azure DevOps has the ability to, to store secrets. We can store files as secrets. Um, and we can even source the secrets from Key Vault. So I don't need to say, hey, look, this, I need to put this in Azure, Key, uh, Azure DevOps and store it in Key Vault. I can actually just reference the source of truth of Key Vault. Um, so if I have any automation in place, I'm just dealing with Key Vault. I love that. With uh, GitHub, we do have the ability to have secrets, which is awesome. I can't have an action that sets a secret, though. It's not a, not a bad thing. It's a bit of a, a, security, a security thing. Um, if I want to pull things out of Key Vaults, um, I do have to write my own script. It is a roll your own scenario. There was an action that could do this, but it's since been deprecated. So I need to write a bit of a, a, uh, Azure CLI script to pull that information down. I can only store um, text in there. So it's key value pairs. I can't do anything complex like files. Um, and I can't have any notes on, on the secret. You know, like sometimes, you know, if you've got a, a secret and it's maybe it has to be a JSON uh, object, um, I'd like to have a little note on there so I can, you know, have some information around there. Because once I write it in there, there's no real way to pull it out. Well, there are workarounds, but um, it's not easy to on purpose. Um, and then much like Azure DevOps, I can have um, secrets scoped to particular environments. In Azure DevOps, you scope it to stages in a pipeline. Um, but I can. what's cool about uh, GitHub is I can have org level secrets, then repo level secrets, then environment level secrets in that repo. So there's a nice sort of... Uh, Matryoshka situation happening there, nesting dolls. So if we go for um, you know, the verdict on deployments, Azure DevOps definitely has my thumbs up of approval. Um, GitHub has my thumbs up of uh, approval as well. It, for um, the simpler cases, um, it's more than enough. It, it, it does a great job. Uh, when you get to super complex cases, um, Azure DevOps will you know, move ahead slightly. Um, you may want to reevaluate and go for a third-party tool, but I'm not comparing third-party tools right now. Okay, we've deployed our code where you know, we want to operate on it and make sure that it runs normally in production. Uh, so let's consider a situation where uh, we've got Azure Monitor run, like looking at our app and it wants to respond to certain things. So like we know that when a certain event gets logged in, in, uh, in the console and that gets reported to Azure Monitor, we want to run a script um, for whatever reason. Uh, contrived situation, but let's just go with it. Um, we're able to trigger both uh, DevOps pipelines and GitHub workflows from HTTP calls. Uh, so it's like, you know, we can do webhooks with this. 
In Azure DevOps, we get our PAT, our personal access token, and we call a specific API with the pipeline ID and we can kick it off and we can even pass it parameters in terms of how, it meant, how it's meant to operate. We can do the same thing for GitHub as well. The only catch is it needs to have this workflow dispatch trigger on there in order to know that it can be kicked, uh, kicked off from a webhook. I, I think this is actually pretty good because then we can see from the workflow file, it's like, hey, someone external could actually use this. Um, if we're talking, like I've talked about third-party tools as well, um, if you're doing things like this, an, an alternative would be uh, Runbooks and Octopus Deploy. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can, you can operate on this. So from an operation point of view, Azure DevOps, thumbs up, GitHub, thumbs up. They offer you know, similar levels of functionality. Okay, we're coming around to the end. Uh, we've operated, we want to monitor the application. There's more than just Azure Monitor. Uh, we want to be able to have our dev teams have insights to see how they're going and how the app is working. So let's have a look at that. In Azure DevOps, uh, we've got a thing called dashboards. They're pretty cool. They look a little bit like Windows 8. So if you loved Windows 8, great. Um, if you don't, this looks like Windows 8. Uh, it's very tied to Azure, which if you're using Azure, again, great. Uh, but it's a bit limited in terms of the functionality. And um, there's not a, there hasn't been a lot of changes to it recently. So um, your mileage may vary. But it is, a, it is a really nice dashboard. So here I can see there's a, a CD pipeline. We can see you know, how many builds, like the length of time and the status. We can see uh, velocity on previous sprints, um, depending on how, how useful that is to you, great. Um, we can see what's in the current sprint, what's being worked on, any pull requests that are out there. That's actually really important. So you want to pay off that merge debt as quickly as possible. So being able to see on a board, like maybe you've got it on a TV in the office that says, hey, we've got a few pull requests out there. Um, let's go and make sure they get merged as soon as possible in case uh, to avoid them being you know, stale. We can see on the current sprints, you know, the number of work items and the status. There's a whole bunch of nice metrics. That's, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, it's very limited in terms of what you can connect to. I think a better tool would be to go for something like a, a Grafana. Um, Azure does have a managed Grafana service uh, now, so you could use that. Now, the cool thing about this is there's a lot of dashboards around the actual application metrics that you can build out. Um, that looks really impressive. It's looking at you know request durations and um, you know the number of milliseconds and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, great for an application. You can actually do this for a GitHub repo as well. So there's a connector you can use and pull in the GitHub stats into Grafana as well. So you're using the same tool and you're pulling out different information. So we can see here um, the number of commits recent, uh, recently, pull requests, the PR average open time. So six days, that's, that's quite a while. You're likely to get merged out if it's that high. So it's gone red. So you know, hey, we need to review our code more frequently. Um, we can see the number of issues, active issues, uh, and a whole bunch of data on there. So you could use Grafana to make these dashboards and actually get a better experience in my opinion. If you are on Azure and using Application Insights, it's level playing field. So you can go into uh, App Insights. Down here, there's a little Work Items uh, tab, and you can add Work Items for GitHub and Azure DevOps from here. There's templates that you fill in, and it'll, it'll either create an issue in GitHub Issues, or it'll create a, a Work Item in your back, backlog. Um, that's, that's super cool. Um, and it's great that you know, this is a level playing field, and it's been like that for I don't know how long, quite a long time. So uh, from the maintenance of an application, um, you know, GitHub, it, it's, got, it's got everything you need. So does Azure DevOps. So I look, I, I kind of think I should update this slide and put a, put a thumbs up for, for GitHub, to be honest, because the Grafana stuff's super, super cool. So maybe I'll, I'll update this when I del deliver this talk next time. So we've talked a lot about this stuff. Um, let's just summarize Azure DevOps versus GitHub. We've talked about the roadmap. Um, one's looking pretty anemic. That's a downside in my opinion. I know it's a complete product, but you know uh, things move on. I want new features. GitHub has that, which is really hot. On Azure DevOps, planning is easier. I can't, I can't get away from that. But GitHub has code spaces. So when, when new developers join, they can get spun up really quickly. And as a consultant, I 
I'm, I'm on like three clients in a week, so I need to chop and change. Being able to um, use code spaces to do this is, is super important. I've got like a two kilo laptop. I'd love to have a lighter one. Azure DevOps, we didn't talk about permissions, but they are more complex than um, the GitHub model. Uh, and the GitHub model, I really love Probot in order to have this policy as code. If you want more um, uh, draconian settings, you, there are different apps to do it. But I think Probot's that nice medium where, hey, you can do what we want. We, you can do what you need to do. We'll just double check, but we trust you. Pipelines and actions, they are fundamentally, fundamentally different. Azure DevOps, I, I don't like the fact that, you know, there's no parallelism. I've, I've gotten used to that now. I want it everywhere. Um, but it does have the pipeline analytics, which is super cool. Uh, GitHub Actions, it's more than just build and deploy. You can automate anything in GitHub. There's a GitHub script that you can use to update even more of it. So it's, it's this, you know, never ending, never ending story of, of awesome things. Test plans is Azure DevOps only, but I don't use it. Uh, so I'm just going to go, look, it's there. If it's if you need it, good. If not, and you got testers, maybe they want to use other products as well. GitHub is kind of open in that in that aspect, so you can bring in other tools to the ecosystem. I do love GitHub's suggesting changes, especially on new developers. They don't need to feel like, hey, you know, please, please, Mister, please, senior, you know, how how do I do this? Uh, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, they can put it out there. We can make suggestions and actually pull them up. Azure DevOps, it does have uh, the better environment gates that we looked at, it does have better secret management. Um, I did say it was you know, about level, um, but I can't deny that they are. It is more feature rich in that area. Hopefully that'll change. Security, GitHub is you know, baked in with security everywhere. So being able to move shift that left as much as possible is awesome. Um, packages, I'm gonna say GitHub for the win. Um, but for, from, my, from my point of view, uh, mostly using NPM and NuGet, they both satisfy. So the final verdict, I do need to sum it up into one thing. GitHub, uh, Azure DevOps does get my thumbs up, I have to say it. But GitHub gets a spicy emoji. It's, uh, it's awesome, um, but there's a little bit of pain sometimes when you, when you chomp down on that chili. So that's approved by me. Um, I've got some QR codes up here. If you want to give feedback, I think it's the one on the left. If you want points and you want points, it's the QR code on the right. Thank you very much.